Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive, uh, and I'm here with Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins and Director of Operations Joan McDonald uh, to discuss with you our plans to have a full evaluation of the operation of Westchester County Airport and to develop uh, a, a new complete master plan project. That master plan project has been anticipated for a number of years. Uh, it, our schedule was changed because of the COVID uh, pandemic and the robust public opinion that we wanted to have as an essential part of this process could not truthfully be dealt with properly during the heart of COVID now that we're post two years later. This is an opportunity for us to brief you on what we intend to do to restart that process, have it come to full fruition with a, uh, with a document that will uh, ultimately go before the Westchester County Board of Legislators for their review and adoption. It will include a full environmental review uh, that will go along with it, and we expect it then to uh, supplant the 1989 uh, full analysis that was done, which is now uh, 33 years old. Our, our challenge at the airport is, uh, is pretty straightforward. We have a unique uh, transportation hub which is not possessed by uh, many other county governments, uh, certainly not, hardly any in our region and very few across the nation. Joan will speak to this a little bit more in a second. It represents a, uh, a transportation hub of value to the business community in both business retention and business attraction to have an airport of the size and scope that the Westchester County Airport is. At the same time, it is meant to be a suburban airport, not an urban airport. And the, the criticism and concern for many, many years of people who live in and around the area is they don't want to see LaGuardia North. And we too do not want to see LaGuardia North. We are not uh, anticipating business at this airport that will compete with what LaGuardia, or for that matter, Kennedy or Newark does within this region. And that is a balancing act between having a facility that serves uh, a couple of different purposes, but at the same time is restricted enough so that it is not proved to be excessively impactful to those people who live around it or under the flight path. Now, we recognize that every public facility has an impact on the neighborhood around it. I've long spoken about the fact that I live in close proximity to Playland. Uh, Playland has an amusement park, which is seasonal, uh, has an impact in a neighborhood that isn't replicated in other parts of the county. Um, most people don't live next to a roller coaster or live next to a, a carousel that has music that uh, entertains uh, the people that attend the amusement park and at the same time impacts the neighbors next to the amusement park. <clears throat> and every one of our major facilities has some of that impact. We have sewer treatment plants, we have golf courses and other parks, we have the Westchester County Center, of which we will do a similar analysis and discuss that at a future point in time. The Westchester County Airport has a scope that is not only immediate because of its physical location, but the fact that airplanes take off and particularly land at this airport and they take a certain route to do that, it impacts other areas that fall underneath the flight path. But it is also true that every public facility exists to serve a public need that is uh, of scope and, and measure much greater than the immediate area that the facility is, is, is in. Every one of our seven sewer treatment plants affect the neighborhoods that they're in, but they treat the sewerage for three quarters of Westchester County's population. And so the impact of those facilities has to be balanced between the impact on neighbors and the overall public good that, that they provide. Now, there are individuals who come down on the philosophical side of this in any number of different ways uh, on both sides of the argument that the airport should be allowed to expand, the, air should, uh, the airport should be contracted, and that the, the different nuances in those two positions are there. That is why we intend to have a robust public debate, uh, both uh, with the public directly to our administration, the three of us as the senior, three senior leaders of this county administration, as well as with the Board of Legislators so that every voice can be heard, every voice, every voice gets a fair opportunity to make its point of view clear, and also that everybody engages in a process that is dynamic for which the development of a final updated master plan involves lots of technical review. And much as we have as American citizens the right to uh, interact with the process, the right to public free speech, we also have the responsibility of responsible analysis, understanding of the details, and responsible free speech, which means to make sure that our comments are based on facts, not fantasy, and based on reality, not what we wish to be true, uh, or the rhetoric of the moment that might get a room full of a people applause, but does not necessarily help us stand the scrutiny of what's ahead of us. Because no master plan 
by Westchester County Airport operates in a vacuum. It will operate under the scrutiny of the federal government, and certainly the state government will have an eye on it as well, to determine if in the act of us identifying how this airport should function in the years to come, that we, uh, we suspend the realities that the FAA controls the skies of the United States of America. We locally do not control that. And we've been through this argument on any number of different issues, and people willfully misrepresent that. Uh, we can only address the truth whenever uh, we have that opportunity. And that is that we have a certain amount of control over this airport, and we lay out how that control is to be structured through a master plan, so that that serves as a dialogue, uh, a framework for dialogue in the years to come. And any structured dialogue will differ depending on who the, uh, the decision makers are. And in years to come, future county executives, future senior leaders will have the ability to look at and amend this document as they see fit, as whatever the, uh, the, the realities are of the moment. Uh, before I get into some of the details of what we want to accomplish, I want my colleagues each to say a few words about the process. I'm going to ask our Director of Operations, uh, Joan McDonald, to speak first. Joan is... Um, if you want to put numbers on our relative authorities, she's the number three person in the administration. Every operational department in this government ultimately reports through Joan as director of operations. And as I'm sure you know from my past introductions for her, she has served as a state commissioner for the New York State Department of Transportation with a, uh, a responsibility for a department that has twice the number of employees as Westchester County does as, as a complete government. She's also been the state commissioner for economic development for the state of Connecticut. So she's in a unique position on both transportation and understanding the realities of New York and Connecticut uh, to be in this position at this time. And we're appreciative of her professionalism, and I wanted to share a couple of her insights next. Joe. Thank you, George. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to pick up on a couple of the points that the county executive made. Uh, you know, first and foremost, the, the high level of public engagement is part of this process. We made a decision at the county executive's direction back in 2019 when we were kicking off this master plan pre-COVID to do two separate uh, tracks for this, uh, this, for this master plan. Number one, the technical analysis, which I'll touch on in a minute, and number two, the, the public involvement and the public engagement. And that is really unique. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration requires uh, public engagement as part of the master plan process, but not to the level as this county executive has directed us to do. So before we get into the technical analysis, we are going to get the public input to get a sense of what the public in Westchester County wants this airport to be, what they would like to see uh, going forward. As the county executive said, it is a major transportation hub. It is also an economic driver. So some of the technical issues that we will be looking at once we uh, kick off this process uh, will be as the FAA requires. We have to do uh, projections uh, for at, at a high, low, and intermediate level to get a sense of kind of where air traffic is projected to be over the time horizon. We will be looking at some of the land use uh, uh, functions both on the airport and surrounding the airport as part of this master plan development and looking at the, the economic drivers that drive this uh, airport. But it's very important to note that we are encouraging everybody to participate in the public engagement process uh, to get a sense of what the, the needs are and what the desires are for this airport. Thank you. Uh, through a series of our uh, public dialogues here on issues, our weekly updates, uh, I'm always joined by Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins. Uh, Ken and I, as I'm sure you know, both had the privilege of being chairs of the Westchester County Board of Legislators at different times. I had that opportunity from 1998 through 2001, uh, slightly over 20 years ago, and Ken had that opportunity 10 years ago, 10 years after I had my tenure in that position. When I was chair of the county legislature, issues of the airport were structured very differently than they are today. Uh, the issues focused almost completely on the commercial side of the airport, the part that you see when you come into the terminal and the flights that came out of that area. Um, and there was very little of the, um, of the growth of general aviation during that period of time. Um, Ken's tenure as board chairman came later, and of course, when I was chairman, the master plan of 1989 was only 10 years old. 
It was 20 years old when Ken took over his responsibilities, and uh, as chair of the legislature, he dealt with an administration of my predecessor who had a different philosophy. And uh, so there was a disagreement between that administration and that board of legislators process. Uh, but Ken, having had that experience and having seen uh, these issues at the airport, also brings his own unique insight into the dialogue that's ahead. So I'd like him to share a few thoughts, and then I'll get into the process a little more deeply. Ken. Thanks, George. Um, and again, to, to echo um, the county executive and our team's com conversation from right from the very beginning. Um, as a different time in 2010 when I was chair of the board, as the county executive had pointed out, that there was such a, a big proliferation in the general aviation side of things. The pandemic actually exacerbated that and showed people again as we're coming out of it now, the utilization in the general aviation side and, and certainly as County Executive pointed out and we all know and Joan has um, talked about several times before, the Federal Aviation Authority, the FAA, is the one that regulates and controls that particular part of the airport. We do have a terminal use agreement. And part of the conversation right now is to have the opportunity to have separate um, opportunities in different tracks to make sure that the public throughout Westchester is involved in this conversation. It's certainly important to make sure that there's environmental protections at the, the airport, but more importantly, there are so many people that utilize the airport, and that was what I faced um, you know, when we were going through the Board of Legislators at the time with the terminal use agreement, the restrictions that are at the commercial side of the building, but the, the other sides where our um, our fixed base operators work out of in the terminals outside of the main commercial terminal, those th two things are together. And it, it is an economic driver for the County of Westchester. It's also a driver for all of the, the travel that Westchester residents expect to be able to do. So this particular process, we are making sure to encourage everyone, and there'll be some more detail about how that happens, to participate and make sure that their voices are heard. And whether you're just a simple traveling member of the public, but you have a business opportunity and you're traveling around, or you have family members and you're trying to reach there. So we um, to reach the different areas without having to go down to Newark or to John F. Kennedy or to LaGuardia to make sure that you have that as part of our mosaic here in Westchester County. Make sure your voice gets heard. It is critically important that your voice has that opportunity. And under County Executive at Latimer's leadership, right from the very beginning, that's been a staple to make sure everyone had an opportunity to be heard, not only first the 2018 sessions that we had, um, the three sessions that we had initially, now in this particular process. So there's not a, a, an excuse for people not to get involved to be able to see what's going on. And again, whether you're a worker or whether you are a participant at the airport, you have this opportunity. Don't have, have a, a chance to not participate and make sure that you have your voice heard. And I know that we'll go through the sessions. You'll have a chance, no matter what part of the county that you're in, to make sure that your voice is heard and you'll be able to give that input to make sure that we can make a better airport. Thanks a lot, George. Let me try to give you some historical perspective of where we are today based on where we've come from. <clears throat> For some individuals who may be uh, residents of Westchester County over the last number of years, five years, 10 years, even 15 years, some of what I'm about to say is ancient history. But it's essential to understand how we got to the point we're at now so that as you look to the future, you understand this is part of a continuum. This is not something that's just plunked down out of nowhere. Um, the, the story basically begins uh, during the World War II era, the 1940s, before any of us were alive, uh, where uh, the, the area that we see as an airport now that's a commercial airport with both uh, general aviation and commercial flights was viewed for military purposes, and it was viewed for the civil defense of Westchester County and more importantly the New York suburbs north of the city and during World War II there was an effort to make sure that we had the ability to defend America from the Axis powers were they to reach a point at which they were going to uh, attack the New York area. We know the way the history books turned out but at the time those decision makers uh, the county executive of that day was a gentleman named of Herb Gerlach. We've named one of the rooms after him. Uh, it was uh, the responsibility of the county government in that day, that county executive, that county board of supervisors, to provide an area of aerial protection. That's what began this airport process. 
After the end of World War II, two major things happened. The first one is the increase in population in suburbia. It really exploded on Long Island, where you had very low-level population and uh, the Levittowns of the world, and Long Island just exploded in terms of its size and scope as a suburb to the point where, it's, where both of those counties are larger than Westchester. Westchester had a significant population outside of New York City, but it too grew dramatically. And the area that was very uh, low-density, uh, population north of the city of White Plains. It was not a 287 in those days. It was not an I-684 in those days. That that what happened above, uh, you know, White Plains, you had a a, a mode of uh, people living in and around Mount Kisco and Bedford, and then, of course, on the western, northwestern side of the county in Austin and Peekskill. But it was very lightly populated in the area of the airport. That changed beginning in the post-World War II era. More people moved in, and, of course, because it's beautiful land, beautiful topography, some of the most uh, impressive homes in Westchester County were built in and around that area. We have had Rye Lake, as we call it, which is part of the, uh, uh, the water system for New York City, uh, provides direct water access for the one million people now of Westchester County, the eight million people plus of New York City. At that point in time, those numbers were less. But uh, being proximate to a water body the size of that was also very attractive. It creates beautiful vistas and, and therefore a greater population. That population grew through the 1950s and 60s. And at that same time, the decision was made by the county uh, fathers of that day, county mothers, although there weren't many women involved in the decision-making process. We've changed that now. Um, the decision was made to make that a public access airport. And initially, uh, there, was, uh, there was very little commercial flights out of that airport. That grew over time. You must remember the jet engine didn't come along until the 1950s, the late 1950s. Propellers were in involved earlier. So air traffic was nothing like the frequency during the 1950s that we've experienced subsequently. That really became much more popular in the 1960s and then in the 1970s, 80s, and so forth. During that period of time, we had a Quonset hut out there that, that represented the terminal, <clears throat> and it looked uh, you know, very much like what, a, what you would expect a military base converted to civilian use would look like. And, and that stayed in effect until the 1980s, when then County Executive Andrew O'Rourke made the decision with the Board of Legislators of that day, prior to my becoming on the Board of Legislators, that it was time to modernize and create a more modern terminal to accommodate the amount of traffic that was coming in from the commercial side of things. And of course, as the population grew, and at the same time so did growth the use of the airport, you began to see some of the conflict that we have today between people who live proximate to the airport and those that use the airport. There's a value in, in its use, and there is a, uh, a certain amount of um, uh, objection by the people who live in and around it to the operation of the airport because it's disruptive to their lives. Something else important happened in the 1960s. County Executive Edwin McCallion, uh, the business leaders of Westchester County at that point in time, were able to tap into the desire of a number of major U.S. corporations that were based in Manhattan that wanted to relocate outside of New York City. And that happened with some corporations moving to northern New Jersey, some moved to Fairfield County, some moved a couple to Rockland County, some to the North Shore or elsewhere on Long Island, and quite a few relocated to Westchester County. And in the area proximate to the one we're talking about, international business machines, IBM, moved their corporate headquarters from New York City to Armonk. PepsiCo, uh, a growing consumer products company, and they subsequently acquired other companies that we know, products like Frito-Lay and so forth, moved to purchase with other uh, uh, spin-off options. And you had other major corporations that were General Foods, which has long since left the area, moved into, uh, into that same basic carter. That growth created jobs and population in Westchester County like we'd never seen before. And I always reference, when we talk about economic development, I talk about how in those days economic development was attract a major corporation from coming out. We had Nestle USA here. Uh, we had AMF, which was once a major sporting uh, uh, equipment place, bowling when it was in its peak, and some other entities uh, along those lines. We've had other major corporations here. Some of them are gone. IBM, PepsiCo remain. Um, uh, we had Texaco Corporation based here. That corporate headquarters is now operated by Morgan, and they are a major corporation with presence in Westchester County. Uh, the Nestle site uh, was vacated. MasterCard moved into that major corporate headquarters. In that very corridor uh, that we're talking about now in proximity to the airport, 
The reasons for those companies coming out here were multiple. I've often jokingly said about what my father told me years ago, it's near New York City, it's not New York City, why he moved from Brooklyn. Those corporations moved to Westchester County because of those same reasons. They could have a suburban lifestyle for the senior management, as well as a suburban work style management with a campus that they could control instead of being in an urban city, uh, city segment, uh, setting, and it was not essential as it may be for, uh, uh, for the financial services companies to be in and around the stock market. The other corporations could function just as well outside of the city in a suburban corporate campus. And of course, as we started to embrace computers throughout the course of the 1970s into the 1980s with desktops and the laptops and the internet that came along in the last 15, 20, 25 years, we now have corporations that can function fully in a suburban setting. That brought uh, a, a tremendous economic boost to this county, and one of the selling factors that made that happen was access to an airport. And the, the practical reality of it is, I have worked for a couple of major American corporations, so is Ken, that <clears throat> senior managers and corporations having an access to an airport allows them the mobility for their senior management, the CEO, president of a company, or other senior managers to move across the country, if not the world, in a moment's notice. Uh, during my years, I served as National Director of Sales for two uh, smaller size companies in the hospitality industry. My travel schedule made my current travel schedule look like nothing. Um, uh, here now I travel to Larchmont and Peekskill and Yonkers and North Salem. In those days, I traveled routinely to the West Coast and to Florida and to the Pacific Northwest to Chicago as if I was going from my kitchen to my living room. And, and I was a junior executive in comparison to these senior executives. Having the access to both commercial flights out of that airport and also general aviation with private jets that can take them anywhere in this country, in North America, and back within the same day, became a very important corporate um, uh, opportunity for them. And with that thought in mind, having that airport became an important reason why those companies moved here and stayed here, among other reasons, the quality of life and the, the proximity to New York City. And that exploded over the course of the 1960s, into the 1970s, and into the 1980s. Westchester County, uh, made an effort to try to control elements of the airport because we, Westchester County, owned the airport. And we decided at one point in time to impose a hard curfew on flights because it is disruptive for planes to come in after midnight, even a little bit earlier than that, or to leave before 6 o'clock in the morning. And, and we were taken to court by the airlines, and in court there was a, uh, a battle, and there was a settlement to the lawsuit that gave Westchester County some unique authority in the way that airport operates, but it also limited the way the county government could limit the functions of the airport. We're having a debate right now in this country, in this, in this county, about people who are criticizing Westchester County because of flights that are coming in from health and human services, bringing immigrants from the border. And there are people out there who repeat the lie that somehow the county government is sponsoring this, or we, we approve of this, or whatever. And uh, you know that is willful, willful ignorance. The bottom line is, that court case proved that Westchester County did not have the ability to impose a mandatory curfew. But what did come out of it was some limits on the corporate side of the airport, where the terminal is, the commercial side of the airport, rather, not the corporate, the commercial side of the airport. It limited the number of gates, four gates, not 10, and it limited the number of passengers per half hour that could come through the airport, 240 per half hour. And before someone says, well, why did you do that? What was the benefit of that? Limiting the number of gates limits the number of airplanes that can be in the airport at any one point in time, and therefore it limits the number of flights. If you had six gates, you could have six planes queued up ready for six flights. If you could, in theory, expand to the point of 10 gates, you might have 10 flights. Anytime you've been to a major airport, you go down, if you ever you know, go through O'Hare Airport or Atlanta, any of the major connecting hubs, you'll go down a, um, a concourse and you'll see 20 or 30 gates, 20, 30 airplanes around those gates. Every one of those planes is going to be taking off in a fairly short period of time. So limiting the number of gates is important, and limiting the number of passengers per half hour also reduces on the, uh, on the commercial side the number of people that can come through the airport. The Quonset Hut was uh, turned into the current terminal. In the 1980s, that was a, uh, a reconstruction done under the O'Rourke administration, which made it easier for the traveling public to, uh, to access it and the corporate uh, public as well. <clears throat> and during the period of time that I alluded to up to during my tenure as uh, chair of the board of legislators, dealing with the corporate side of the airport was seen as the major issue. 
What has happened in American business, and I'm, I'm sure you follow this at some level, is that corporations determined that having their executives go through the standard commercial flights was not as an efficient use of their time as being able to either have their own corporate jet take those individuals to a location or being able to rent a jet, charter a flight. And those happen through fixed-based operators. And to the greater extent, not wholly, but to the greater extent, those fixed-based operators are located on the west side of the airport. You access uh, their buildings primarily from Purchase Street that goes through the Purchase section of the town of Harrison. You don't see them when you are in the commercial side of the airport in the terminal waiting for your JetBlue flight or whatever flight is, is uh, taking off. There are a couple of FBOs that are north of the terminal on the east side of the flight. You see them as you come in to your right. And organizations like Signature, Ross, um, slightly different when I use the phrase NetJets, they're not exactly an FBO in the traditional sense of it, Millionaire, of which you've read a lot about, uh, all are fixed-based operators that provide general aviation uh, support to the traveling public and particularly to the corporate public and that has changed dramatically over the last 15 to 20 years and that is where the growth of the airport is. As Ken alluded to, when the pandemic came, commercial air flights dropped like a stone. People were not comfortable getting on a, an airplane flight with strangers if, if there was this communicable disease and we saw a tremendous drop off. But on the, com on the um, general aviation side of the airport, there was some diminution, and it came back up as part of demand much faster. Why do I give you this backstory? So you understand that when we do a master plan, if we're going to do a professional master plan that will hold up to the scrutiny of the FAA, potentially to the scrutiny of a lawsuit, if any aggrieved party believes that somehow we have inappropriately structured this master plan, we have to be able to explain in, in business terms as well as in community terms what it is that we see this airport being. And, and I certainly know from running for public office, slogans have their place and people respond to those slogans. We don't want LaGuardia North, fine. We don't want to privatize the airport and lose control of the airport, fine. But in a master plan process, we have to put an intellectual rigor to these analyses. What you see on that table over uh, to the right of the screen is the 2017 master plan that was prepared by our predecessors. Uh, we review the master plan, and we believe that we can do a better job of that master plan with better public input than went into that document and a greater sensitivity to the concerns of the community than went into that document. We view the process that's before us now as, in essence, the creation of a brand new master plan. We work off of the base of this particular master plan, but we view this as a base, not necessarily uh, the final product to be tweaked. However, my predecessor administration got federal grant money to do this process, and they had to complete that process within a certain time frame or repay the federal government money that they were given in grants. So as they completed the process, uh, we found it not to be uh, uh, effective enough, and so we made the commitment to accept this as the master plan legally, but that we would make that commitment, public commitment, to provide a, a new master plan and that master plan would have the proper public uh, input and it would have the, the intellectual scrutiny and, and rigor that would be necessary for a document to stand up to review in the years to come. That is the commitment that Joan alluded to a few minutes ago. We originally planned to start this process in the beginning of 2020. And uh, when, when COVID came, we knew that we couldn't have some of the public dialogue, we wouldn't be able to pull together resources. And we also knew that analyzing market demand would be almost impossible when market demand dropped. Uh, it, it would be fruitless. So we would have to wait to see when things would stabilize, and we believe we are at that point now. The airport has an economic development impact in this county, and this master plan process has to demonstrate what that economic development is. It cannot just be asserted, it has to be demonstrated. There are individuals out there who challenge that. There are individuals who are out there who say, well, it really isn't that much of an economic development, and they'll have their reasons for it. They need to be heard, they need to present their information, uh, and then we also need to hear from those people that would argue the counter, which is it does have, uh, does have a, a significant uh, economic impact. And you have to know what you're doing and what, what impact will come from the decisions you make. 
If you make a decision to do this and you think that's satisfactory, will there be a loss of jobs? Will there be a loss of uh, attractiveness? Could we lose business because of it? We need to test that out and make sure we understand that. That is the part of the analysis that, that Joan referenced that does not involve just public input, but professional scrutiny of facts and statistics, analysis and comparisons with other airports around. And those two things, the popular feeling about things and the professional analysis of things, have to be merged in the final document. This is not a three-week process by which we will come forward and say, here's a document, you like it. Uh, people will want to jump to through the conclusion, will this expand the airport? We have taken the following philosophy, and this administration has been in now into its fifth year. We came in office, and the first thing we did is we stopped progress toward privatization. While there were professional organizations that said they could manage the airport, privatization was offered as a way, frankly, to, uh, to liquefy financially the airport, benefit the county in the short term, and those proposals that came out in the two prior years benefited the county in the short term and did not benefit in the long term. We have turned out to be able to stabilize the county's finances without doing anything like that, and we still control that portion of the, of the airport that we control. And, and we stopped the privatization effort. Joan's effort and her operations team, let's credit Emily Saltzman, let's credit Hugh Grecian, who is our commissioner of DPWT, uh, the people with Avports, which are our contractors that, that manage the airport. Uh, we've been able to uh, work through and get modern noise monitoring equipment in place now. We did not have modern noise quality equipment when we came into office, and we put those in. We made a point of showing that placed in different locations to properly track what noise was happening, because we cannot go to the FAA looking for any kind of relief of noise with anecdotal information. We can't rely on those people who call in to complain. Some people will call in sometimes, and there are some people for whom the noise is a constant problem, and they will call in literally hundreds of times. That does not impress the FAA, and ultimately it's the FAA that will control what happens in the skies. And if we're going to have any relief from noise in any way, shape, or form, it's not going to be based on anecdotal information. It's going to be based on factual information. Modernizing that equipment was an essential step which we accomplished. We made sure that people understood that we wanted to hear the voice. So we had, as Ken alluded to, those three public forums in which people were invited to come and give open-ended testimony, which is where, when we complete this conversation today, we'll, we will start, which is a series of public forums. We have a couple scheduled. We'll have more in which people were able to come and express their feelings and, 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 and sort of lay out uh, what their thinking is. It's been four years since those summertime activities in 2018, and we think it's perfectly appropriate to restart the process by doing that again. But we made sure we had that vehicle as available. We also modernized our noise complaint process so that people had a more efficient way of registering their complaint. It doesn't work perfectly. It works far better than it did before. We also accepted the fact that there was, that there was some incidence of and the potential for pollution from the airport into the drinking watershed. And that has particularly been identified by an acronym, PFAS, which stands for a chemical compound that was used at the airport 35 years ago for firefighter training for the Air National Guard. And when that foam was used, it sunk into the ground, and particles of it, which, which have this PFAS component of it, do not break down in the natural environment. And, and they can move, as, as things will happen underground, toward the drinking watershed. John Noner, our county attorney, has taken on that as a major important task. Uh, we have a consent order with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to remediate that. We have ensured that not a droplet of PFAS has made it into the drinking watershed, and we spend quite a bit of money for remediation, for putting in now new piping systems to serve some of the entities that are in proximity to the airport. We have been fully committed to the environmental uh, correction of any problems there, as we have been committed to any drainage, any stormwater drainage on the surface of the airport, all of which is angled to go south in the opposite direction of the drinking watershed. So when somebody says, oh, they have things at the airport, it's going right into our watershed, that's not true. That is not true. And you, now that you know it's not true, if you repeat it, you're lying. We don't want liars. We want people to understand what the facts are. The drainage from stormwater goes to the southern part of the airport, and we have a collection system, which we have continued to invest money in to make sure we collect the stormwater, as well as any de-icing fluid that is put on the airplanes during the wintertime. And if you've seen de-icing applied, I'm sure you have. It's sprayed onto the, uh, to the airplane to make sure that the flaps and the, uh, uh, the tail can move properly, that it doesn't ice up, causing a fatal accident. 
and that water drains out, and there's a collection system by which that de-icing fluid is captured and trucked off of the property, not let to drain out south of the airport down into the Blind Brook or into Long Island Sound. These are efforts being made to ensure the environmental protection of the airport. And this master plan can go much further. This master plan can set standards for green usage of all of the buildings on that airport, to, to use less energy, to make sure that we're recycling in all categories and, and have a less environmental footprint that is not in place today, this master plan can deliver that. But for people who might casually talk about the environmental impact of the airport, we've been completely committed to spending the money necessary. We reestablished well water testing to determine whether or not there was pollution in the various wells uh, and, and we knew that that was an essential process. And if we find it, when we find it, we have to take remedial action to clear it up. So all of these things are part of a particular philosophy. In the master plan process itself, there are a number of different areas that we have to look at. We have to look at the runway system of the airport. The only major capital project in these four and a half years that we have instituted is a repavement of the main runway. It is not a lengthening of the runway. It was not a strengthening of the runway. It does not allow for heavier, bigger planes to come in, but it does provide a current, up-to-date, safe standard. Just like repaving the, the road in front of the, you know, the street that you live on, we repave it. We don't allow uh, you know, tanks to now come on those roads. It's the same traffic that we would normally have. Other than that, we need to look at the runway system and discuss the design, the pavement, the alignment, the various requirements, the taxiway system, the, 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 the roads that lead into the runway, the design standards, the capacity, the ground flow analysis, that has to be part of this. We have to look at navigational and visual approaches to the airport so that those that are flying in uh, understand how to negotiate it, not only when it's a beautiful day, but when it's rainy, when it's foggy, at night, and that they have the, the correct visual information. We have to look at Everything that involves the commercial passenger terminal complex, the gates, the apron, uh, those planes that are uh, housed there, the terminal building itself, the curbside reality, parking at that location. We look at the general aviation, the fixed-based operators, corporate aviation, parking, and we make conclusions in this area. Any of our support facilities, the firefighting capacity out there, the aircraft rescue capacity out there, should there be a tragedy, how we store fuel at that location, uh, the de-icing services, all of our operations, and now with increased scrutiny of air traffic, the, uh, the TSA requirements for scrutiny uh, to make sure that people before they board an airplane are properly screened to make sure that they are not a threat. All of those things that I've just mentioned are elements of what has to go into a master plan and have to be analyzed and, uh, and broken down into a professional um, assessment of where are we and where do we intend to go as part of all of this process. We have in this airport a tremendous facility, and we also have a facility that can be very problematic, and we recognize that. There's 700 acres, 21 aircraft hangars. Uh, we have jets uh, that, are, that are based there as corporate entities. Most of the FBOs want to uh, have additional storage capacity. They assert that if they can store more planes at the airport, they will have less flights. How could that be? They will argue, and we have to see the argument and scrutinize the argument, that if a plane is based there, it leaves there, takes the passengers to its destination, brings them back, that's two transactions, as opposed to basing the airplane someplace else, Teterboro for the sake of this discussion. Bring them from Teterboro to Westchester, pick up the passengers, fly, come back, and then go back to Teterboro, that's four actions. But the FBOs will have to, as part of this process, make the case and make it strongly enough so that people uh, see it and hopefully appreciate it. This airport employs 1,485 full-time employees. And that, that is an important situation. There's $735 million in economic activities, and uh, all of those things have to come into the factor. I, uh, I close my general comments, and then we'll take questions from the press that's in the room, and if we have any press that's remote. Um, this process intends to be open and inclusive. We know that people have strong feelings about the airport uh, on both sides. This asset represents something that affects one million people, all of the people of Westchester County. Everybody may not use it, but some people work there, 
And some people may fly out of there for personal reasons. Some people may work for a corporation that uses it as an airport, as well as those people that, that live in and around the airport. I've tried to be very even-handed in all of my rhetoric relative to the airport. We need to hear all the voices. We want to hear all the voices, knowing that some of those voices will be in direct conflict. But this is a democracy. And in a democracy, we let all voices be heard, not just the most agitated voices, and not the voices that bring a particular ideology or political affiliation. We listen to all voices. But we still make assessments. We use the, the, the skills that we're given to try to come up with what we think is the best possible plan for the future. I have the good fortune to be your county executive today. If I, uh, if I complete my maximum tenure in this office, I have a little more than three and a half years left. This airport will be here long after I'm out of office. I want to make sure that this process is so thoroughly done that in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, people will look at this document and say, this was well thought through. This was analytical. This was inclusive. This was a legitimate roadmap for where we go. In 15 or 20 years, no one can predict what technology will create for us. We may have the ability to travel in ways then that we have no idea uh, that exist today. If somebody told me there was something that we could create called an internet in 1990, I would have looked at them with a fuzzy eye. And in 1990, I was almost 40 years of age. But something came along that I couldn't even fathom the internet. And then if you told me when I saw the, the, the first signs of the internet in the year 2000 that there was something called social media that could replace the newspaper in people's lives, I wouldn't have believed you in the year 2000 when I was in my late 40s approaching my 50th year. Changes will come, but we need to have an intelligent process that analyzes what we can analyze, lay the game plan out, and then hopefully, uh, if it's properly reviewed, if it has the support of the Board of Legislators, we now have a roadmap for the future. We owe that, this administration owes that, not just to the people that have put us here or to the people that we work with today, we owe that to the future generations of Westchester residents. I've mentioned names, I'll repeat them as I close. Herb Gerlach is a name that's been forgotten. County executive who was the person who made the decisions, along with others, to make a military airport a public airport. Andrew O'Rourke, also uh, departed from us now, who made the decision that a major renovation at that airport was necessary. These were individuals in their moment in time that made decisions that still matter to us today. Let us make decisions that can stand the scrutiny of time. With that, we'll go to any questions in the press, and we do have some members of the press present in the room. Uh, Tony Aiello. Uh, George, um, I've spent some time at the airport today, a lot of activity, busier, busiest that I've seen it in, in quite some time, and you're getting a, a, a new carrier there called Breeze. Should people read into the arrival of Breeze a, a direction one way or another that might affect the planning process? Well, uh, Breeze Airlines coming in is working within our terminal use agreement. We have certain limits, and there are certain ways by which new carriers can come in and get, uh, get slots at the airport. They have followed the existing TUA format, so it isn't, uh, some people might say, oh, new airline coming in, oh, that's expansion. Um, uh, Breeze is, is opening up certain cities that have not been opened up previously uh, by other carriers. And so I think what, what, what it does tell you, Tony, is that uh, there, there is a market out there that can be addressed by different carriers who have different ways of reaching those marketplaces. And I think that's part of what's coming up in the future. Uh, I do think it tells you one other thing, which is there's great demand out there for use of this airport. And so shaping that demand, the comparison would be um, if I talk to my colleague uh, who is the Broome County Executive, Broome County being Binghamton, the county of Binghamton is this, uh, they have an airport that also has commercial flights, and they are desperate to try to expand the presence of uh, commercial flights and, and FBOs at that location. Uh, their market doesn't have the same kind of strength ours does. Breeze's presence in the marketplace tells you that there's a strength and a demand at Westchester County Airport, so we have to manage that demand if we want to do the right thing. Um. Do you want to hear from people who live in Connecticut during this process? Yes. Uh, we're open to anyone who uh, lives uh, in, in any proximity uh, because they, too, are affected by the airport. They're benefited by the airport. We don't have a restriction as to who can use the airport. And uh, as planes come into the airport, they don't uh, have to know the dotted lines of what state is what to come in. So, yes, in fact, we have a meeting coming up uh, with Greenwich officials to go over with them, amongst other things, our process in this area. And uh, they, too, will have their voice at the table. 
And could I ask Joan, um, do you have any current stats? I mean, are, are we seeing a, a pickup in traffic there? Um, in, in, uh, as, as we come out of the pandemic? Sure, I don't have the actual numbers with me. We'll be happy to get them to you, but, but that is exactly what we're assessing right now. When we started this process in 2019, and as I said, uh, the FAA requires us to do low, high, intermediate uh, projections on uh, passengers, uh, and then the pandemic hit, at the time, anecdotally, uh, our, uh, our consultant, Merchant Aviation, we, were, we thought that uh, air traffic on the commercial side would not pick up until 2024, 25. Uh, what we have all experienced, not only at this airport, but nationwide on the commercial side, is that pickup started in summer, uh, fall 2021, and it has not let up. We are seeing higher, you know, we're within the, terminal use agreement, but we are seeing increased travel at the airport, and we'll get you those numbers. And then do you happen to have a, I know you do some surveys of people who use the airport. Do you have a guesstimate as to what percentage are New York residents versus Connecticut residents? We, we don't have that breakdown. Uh, other questions, we'll check with Catherine Chaffee, no others. Uh, any of the media outlets that are picking up this uh, stream, if you're interested in uh, following up with any of us on these questions, please give a call to Catherine Chaffee, our Director of Communication at 914-995-2932. And uh, I would highlight that anyone who's watching this video that wants to share their public opinion about these things, they're welcome to send us an email at communications at westchestergov.com. Each communication that we receive will be responded to, and uh, we welcome that public input. If there are no other questions, then we'll thank you for watching. This is a work in progress. Uh, that progress will continue now with the first of uh, a number of different uh, public sessions, and I'll mention them to you. They'll be posted as well so that you'll be able to see this. We begin the process of public input on Tuesday, May 24th, with a session at 6 p.m. It'll be at Pace Law School, the Elizabeth Haub School of Law, at Pace Law School that's on North Broadway in White Plains at 6 p.m. The second session is scheduled for Thursday, June 2nd at 6 p.m., and that will be at Manhattanville College, particular location on campus to be announced as we get closer to it. A week after that, uh, we will be Thursday, June 9th at 6 p.m. at Mercy College in Dobbs Ferry, also happens to be Broadway, uh, in Dobbs Ferry. We intend to hold some other in-person uh, town halls on this topic. Uh, in other locations, we intend to be in northern Westchester, uh, both northwestern Westchester, northeastern Westchester, the southeast portion of the county, which would be New Rochelle Sound Shore. And we will also have a virtual public session. We'll announce these and we'll spread these out over the coming months so that people have an opportunity to be heard uh, and come out and speak. Keep in mind, when you come to these forums, we do not have a plan to give to you that you can comment off of. This is to get the general input of what people want to see. And so uh, what I would suggest you do is put a homework. Go online, westchestergov.com, look at some of the documents that are airport specific that will help you understand the framework of what we're dealing with. Uh, I believe our prior uh, you know, master plan that was uh, most recently done that, that we are going to uh, uh, update and modernize uh, is there. And uh, if you have the 1989 master plan, that'll give you a framework of what we talked about 30 some odd years ago. But if you look at that, that will help give you a framework for your comment. But we take whatever comments that you have, uh, plus or minus, all voices will be heard, all voices will be included in the overall uh, response that we have. So with that, we thank you all for watching. Uh, I'm George Latimer, Worcester County Executive. We wish you a good and safe week. Uh, we will be communicating again for sure next Monday for our, our normal weekly update at 2 p.m. And uh, as we have already this week, if we have other items of importance, we'll share them with you. We hope you'll find them interesting. Have a good day.